Tasmania, an ancient island with a hundred million year history, holds clues about the way the world was once shaped. Now great nature reveals its secrets. From the murky depths of a blood red sea, and the strange creatures that live in it, to a wind-lashed wilderness. Vast forests crowded with prehistoric plant life. And the peak of an age-old mountain unlike any other on Earth. The Great Nature Team is traveling to Tasmania, an island 240 kilometers off the southern tip of Australia. Their first stop is the capital city, Hobart. It's November, mid-spring in the southern hemisphere and the seas around Tasmania are crowded with oysters, scallops, and other marine life that help feed the islanders and support the local economy. But away from busy Hobart, on the west side of the island, is a vast wilderness stretching over 14,000 square kilometers. Among its dense forests and misty mountains are clues to the incredible forces that shaped the earth as we know it today. In 1982, the Tasmanian wilderness was named a World Heritage Site. And among all the incredible places here, one in the southwest is unlike any other. Bathurst Harbour. Director Hideki Nagao has come to meet marine biologist Dr. Karen Gowlett Holmes, who has closely studied Bathurst Harbour and agreed to show them around. Her office walls are lined with photographs of strange and exotic looking sea creatures. They're among the 50 rare species that live in the Tasmanian Sea, and the rarest of all are found in Bathurst Harbour. Here. Yes, there. And this is in the Southwest National Park. It's 150 kilometres and a two day journey from Hobart to the harbour, and careful preparations are made for the trip. few roads or people in the Tasmanian wilderness, the best way to get to the harbour is via open sea. A colony of Australian fur seals race to greet the passing ship.
This is an important habitat for the seals. The seas around Tasmania are a rich hunting ground. Having followed the coastline west around the island for 140 kilometers, they reach the gateway to the harbor. A narrow inland channel around 10 kilometers long connects Bathurst Harbor to the sea. The journey now feels very different as rocky waves make way for calm waters. One hour later, they get their first glimpse of the mysterious Bathurst Harbour. As they arrive, Hideki immediately notices the water is a different colour. Diving equipment's quickly prepared. Everyone's keen to see exactly what's happening beneath the surface. If the water looked strange from above, it looks even stranger from below. It's the color of blood. The red water shuts out the light and it's difficult to see as they carefully measure their descent to the harbor floor. Just two meters from the surface, it's almost pitch black. By the time they're four meters down, it is. The water is no longer red but without their lights, they wouldn't be able to see a thing. Sand clouds the water as their feet hit the harbor floor. They have entered a dark, mysterious world. And incredibly, they are just seven meters from the surface. But beneath the veil of darkness, the seabed is ablaze with color. A patchwork of coral sweeps across the harbour floor. Coral usually needs sunlight. It seems strange to find them thriving in the dark. And some of them are a big surprise. These gently waving tendrils are a species of coral called sea whips.
They're typically found at depths between 35 to 200 meters. Yet they're flourishing here in the shallows. Bathurst Harbour seems to have been invaded by creatures from the deep. Like this tiny animal. It's a sea spider, some species of which live at depths of up to 200 meters. The astonishing life in the dark continues to unfold. One type of coral opens its arms like a flower to capture passing food. Tiny pieces of plant life carried here by the river. Other types of coral look even more bizarre. Sea pen date back 600 million years well before life had evolved to walk on land. There are unexpected sights everywhere they look. Colonies of stalked ascidian. Encrusting soft coral. Even slate pencil sea urchin that are normally found 600 meters down. One of the strangest looking things they see is this. It's a draft board shark egg. It's attached by tendrils to a dead sea whip coral and will hatch in around 12 months time. A draft board shark patrols the shallows. It spends most of its life at depths of around 400 meters but visits Bathurst Harbour to breed. This is a good place to lay its eggs, as there are few predators. And other visitors lay equally strangely shaped eggs. The babies are inside the bulge in the middle. This egg belongs to one of the world's most unusual looking sharks. The elephant shark, so called because of its trunk like mouth, is a living fossil. It usually lives 200 meters down and hasn't changed for hundreds of millions of years. The further they look, the more deep sea species they find. Like a red gurnard perch, normally found at 600 meters. and a basket star that can live between 40 and 300 meters. Hideki wants to know if the presence of deep sea creatures is somehow connected to the red water. They collect a sample of water from the bottom of the harbor 
and a sample of red water from the surface. Hideki volunteers to see if they taste different. And they do. The red water is far less salty. And that's an important clue. The average depth of Bathurst Harbour is less than 10 metres. And it has two distinct layers. Clear seawater at the bottom. Red fresh water on the top. This creates a very special environment. Karen explains why deep sea creatures live here. Normally, the deep sea animals will only survive where it's dark, but also where there's no waves. And so that's in deeper water. But in the Bathurst Channel and the Bathurst Harbour, because we have the, the dark fresh water on top, makes it very dark underneath in the sea water. The red water stops sunlight reaching the bottom, helping create the dark environment deep sea creatures need. There's also less oxygen in the red water, which makes it hard for plankton to breed. That means the harbour doesn't attract submarine species that would usually live in the shallows. Another thing deep sea creatures like is the fact that the harbour is so still. The 10 kilometre channel leading to the ocean acts as a buffer and calms the seawater coming in. Bathurst Harbour's red waters are a revelation. Now Hideki wants to know where the colour comes from. To find out, they're back on land. But it's far from dry. They're wading across a huge wetland. A makeshift bridge leads across a river running into the harbour. And its water is just as red. This is what Karen has brought Hideki to see. Button grass. A type of grass that only grows in wetlands spreads as far as they can see. The red colour in the water comes from the peat the grass is growing out of. The peat is formed from button grass that's decayed over thousands of years and contains a compound called tannin, also found in tea and wine. The tannin seeps out of the peat and is washed away by the rain. Eventually it reaches the river, flowing into the harbour and stains the water red. When the tannin-stained water reaches the harbour, it stays there. It doesn't flow out to open sea because of the channel. But a big reason this part of Tasmania is such a huge wetland lies deeper underground.
beneath the peat are layers of a type of white rock called quartzite. Quartzite is formed when quartz-rich sandstone is exposed to high temperatures and intense pressure. And it is incredibly hard. It's remarkably resistant to erosion and is spread beneath the soil across a large part of West Tasmania. As a result, water can't drain away. And Western Tasmania receives a lot of rain. This map shows rainfall figures across the island. Parts of the west clearly get far more rain than the rest of Tasmania. Sometimes over 3,000 millimeters a year. What brings so much rain to the west of the island is about to become clear to Hideki. What? It's connected to the fierce westerly winds. Simply standing is a challenge. Hideki's wind speed measuring anemometer is almost pushed to breaking point. 22.5 meters a second is gale force. The westerly winds pick up a lot of water as they cross the Antarctic Ocean. And a range of mountains blocks their passage across Tasmania. The water-filled winds rise up the mountains, turn to rain clouds, and soak the west of the island. Dry winds then sweep down the other side of the mountains, and with them comes a drier climate. The low nutrient land in the west is a rain-soaked wetland. Initially, button grass is one of the few plants that can flourish. But when the grass dies and turns to peat, it creates a seedbed for other plants. Over time, large areas of the wetland have turned to rainforest. The next landmass off the coast of West Tasmania is South Africa, and that means the prevailing westerly winds travel over 10,000 kilometers before reaching land. Subsequently, Tasmania has some of the cleanest air in the world. and from the cleanest air falls the purest rain. Many houses in western Tasmania have large water tanks outside and rainwater is enjoyed straight from the tap. It's even bottled and sold in shops. Millions of years ago, Tasmania separated from the South Pole 
as the world we know today began to take shape. Most of the forests in the west of the island are eucalyptus forests. It's thought eucalyptus first appeared 70 million years ago, which given the ancient history of the earth is relatively recent. Normally, eucalyptus trees like dry weather and plenty of sunshine. But in wetter and cloudier West Tasmania, they adopt special strategies. Shedding their bark encourages rapid growth as they race to reach the sun. And it's thought discarded bark has another use. There are around 2,000 forest fires a year in Tasmania. Fire is disastrous for many trees. But it's thought eucalyptus trees shed their bark to act as kindling. Fire is one way of eliminating the competition. Flames reach the eucalyptus trees too, but this has benefits as well. Their branches are decked with tough, woody seed pods. Fire encourages the pods to crack open and spill their seeds. Ash in the soil adds nutrients and heat stimulates seeds already in the ground to sprout. From button grass to eucalyptus trees and back, it's a pattern that has been repeated in West Tasmania for millions of years. As fire burns trees down, button grass spreads. Eucalyptus trees follow and eventually block out the sun. Over time, eucalyptus and plants that thrive in the shade have taken over much of the west of the island. But on the higher ground and mountains, forest fires are rare because of the heavy rain. Eucalyptus hasn't taken over here. These forests are almost the same as they were 200 million years ago. Some trees and plants here date back to a time when Tasmania was connected to the South Pole as part of a giant supercontinent called Gondwanaland. One forest is especially remote and at its heart is one of the island's most famous mountains, Frenchman's Cap. Hideki and the team are back on the road as they set off to explore the ancient wilds of Tasmania. Hey, guys. Yeah. Leading the way will be a group of nature experts and tour guides. Steph Gebby, leader of the group, has planned the route. tough 26 kilometer trek lies ahead as they explore Tasmania's ancient forests. The trip will take about three days and at the end stands their greatest challenge, Frenchman's Cap. 
All right. Yay, upwards and onwards. See you, Ryan. <laughs> Hideki expects the unexpected as the expedition begins. They need to cover around 17 kilometers on day one and to reach the campsite in six hours before the sun sets. The only way into the wilderness is on foot. Okay, so this is the bridge over the Frank River. Ooh. So we're going to have a little break here. Uh, this is what's known as a wash down station. So uh, if everyone wants to take their packs off. Yep. The forest is full of rare and endemic species and preventing potentially harmful bacteria from entering on their boots is vital. <laughs> But boots don't stay clean for long. And with Steph watching, it's a mistake to try and avoid walking through the mud. You get that? Sorry, 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 sorry. The first half of the day is spent trekking through the confines of the forest. Which is? Which is? Suddenly, the view opens up. Got a perfect view. Good one, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Look at that. Look at that. And snow on top. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yep, that, that's Frenchman's cap. <laughs> oh, cool. That's their target, Frenchman's cap the quartzite mountain over a billion years old. <laughs> Patches of snow still cling to its peak. And standing between them and this remarkable mountain is an ancient forest that holds a key to the past. After six hours, the first day's trek is nearly over. But there's one last hurdle to overcome. Their path has turned into a quagmire. It's a relief to get through it and to close in on the campsite and a hot meal. As they arrive at camp, Steph spots they have an unexpected visitor.
It's a type of wallaby native to Tasmania called a padamelon. And it seems less interested in the new arrivals than in finding some food. As the last touches to the tents are made, dinner's ready. Moroccan lamb stew, the perfect end to an exhilarating day. Day two arrives, and the journey continues. They only need to cover around six kilometers today, but the going is much tougher. Everyone carries around 15 kilograms of equipment, and now they can really feel its weight. After an hour's slow climb, a mountain stream is a welcome opportunity for Hideki to enjoy some of Tasmania's famous fresh water. As they climb higher, the route becomes much rockier and more precarious. One wrong step here and it's a long way down. But Steph's found one of the forest's age-old secrets Look what I found! Huh? Our first Vegas! Come on up if you want. Oh, oh, look. Perfect! Ah. It's an ancient type of tree called Vegas, and its leaves are the same shape as the Vegas found in the South Pole. It's living proof that Tasmania was once part of the supercontinent Gondwana land. And Hideki notices the leaves are strangely sticky. Yeah, so that's usually a defense against the cold. So if leaves are small and hard with like a waxy coating, then it stops the actual leaves freezing. So if you get like a really cold snap over spring, then it won't kill off the leaves. From green in spring, to yellow in autumn, Fagus are the only trees in Tasmania that change colour. And the Fagus tree is just a taste of what lies ahead. An age-old forest stretches out before them. It's like stepping back in time 200 million years. Tasmania is the only place in the southern hemisphere with a cool temperate rainforest this size.
An evergreen conifer called a king billy pine towers over 40 meters high. King billy pines are only found in Tasmania and they date back 150 million years. The Tasmanian sassafras is another rare giant. This one is around 45 meters tall and secretes a sweet scent. Man ferns first appeared around 340 million years ago, long before the dinosaurs. And when spring arrives, the claw-like flowers of the Tasmanian warata bloom. Around 1,300 different types of moss and lichens live in the forest too. It's a living museum of plants and trees. There he is, the mighty Frenchman. Stepping out of the ancient forest, now it's time to tackle the last part of their expedition. That is, indeed. <laughs> Frenchman's cap. mountain towers over deep and dramatic valleys. Shifting glaciers during the Ice Age have shaped breathtaking scenery. Moving ice even scarred the quartzite. It's evidence of the incredible force of the glaciers that they cut such hard rock. Day two draws to a close as they approach the campsite. But first, Hideki wants to take a closer look at the mountain they'll be climbing tomorrow. The mighty Frenchman. Ah, this is Frenchman's cap. Yep. Wow, so close to the top. Wow, this is. Pretty impressive. For over a billion years, Frenchman's cap has withstood incredible tectonic forces and giant moving glaciers. It's thought that the mountain's unusual name stems from the shape of the caps worn by French revolutionaries called Liberty Caps. Hopefully tomorrow, Hideki will see the Tasmanian wilderness from the top of this extraordinary mountain. The final day of the Great Nature Expedition arrives. It's only three kilometers to the summit and they can leave most of their equipment at the campsite. But that doesn't mean they're in for an easy day. The journey so far has taken its toll. And 
now they're at an altitude of over a thousand meters. There are no more footpaths. From here on, it's a steep climb. Every step has to be taken with great care. Frenchman's Cap is home to Tasmania's oldest exposed rock, quartzite, from the earliest geological age, the Precambrian era, over a billion years ago. As the climb intensifies, patches of ice are still clinging to the rocks. The last stretch of their journey is the hardest part of all. But finally, after an exhausting three-day trek, they are within sight of the summit. And it's been worth the effort. The view leaves Hideki speechless. It's a picture of the West Tasmanian wilderness, unlike any other, and a fitting end to great nature's exploration of this beautiful and enigmatic island.